to today's Research Reproducibility Grand Round. Um, my name is Melissa Rathelson, for those of you who don't know me, and I am the director here of the library. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Julie Kiefer, who is um, one of our journalist extraordinaires on campus and who has been really um, supportive throughout our entire process of work in this area and so we are really delighted that she can come and speak with us today from a journalistic uh, standpoint about this issue of research reproducibility so welcome great yeah thanks to um, Melissa and Melanie uh, here at the Eccles Health Sciences Library for having me over um, I work, as she mentioned, I work in uh, the Office of Public Affairs here for University of Utah Health with um, Stacy back there. So um, we're your go-to people when you have science news, don't forget that. <laughs> um, but I also have a science background, and so um, these issues that um, we're talking about with research reproduci re reproducibility, um, I've experienced in my li lifetime and you know, um, certainly um, take these issues to heart. Um, so I wanted to talk today about something that's probably a little bit different than what you've been going through in the grand rounds, and that's how research reproducibility and issues with it um, can impact the public perception of science. Um, I won't have any hard uh, answers for you, but um, I think you'll see some, some interesting cases. Um, so the way uh, we're going to go through this today is um, talk about uh, when we're talking about research reproducibility, and the problems with research reproducibility, um, what does the public see? Um, I know you've talked about um, a lot about how these issues play out in, in labs and in research, but um, I think the public perception is actually quite different. Um, and so I'll go through two case studies and um, impacts of those. Um, why does all of this matter? Um, and then talk about sort of the different people who have um, a stake in um, making sure that we have accurate information out there and even touching on what you can do. Um, so I know you've talked about this a lot. So what are, just yell out, what are some of the causes of uh, irreproducible science? Poor reporting. Poor reporting. <laughs> Go right for the journalist angle, okay. <laughs> Anything else? What goes on in this, with the science? Bad cell lines. Bad cell lines. What about our uh, small study sizes, right? Small sample sizes. Um, P hacking. P hacking. Um, how about uh, when somebody's intentions are not so mm -hmm. noble? Just fraud, right? So. Um, I would argue that uh, when, when the reproducible, irreproducible science makes the biggest impact on the public kind of in two ways. And one is uh, these cases of fraud that um, have made it, some of them have made it in the news. Now, of course, the ones that make it in the news are usually published in high impact journals and have some sexy angle to it. But um, these are a couple of um, fraud cases that made a big splash in the last couple of years. Uh, I won't go into them in detail because we'll go into different case studies after this. Um, but one was this, um, this report that came out in Science Magazine about how uh, people who were gay um, went out to, uh, to neighborhoods to talk about how uh, legalizing gay marriage could impact them. And the idea was, you know, if, if I have a stake in this issue, can I better convince you that this is an important issue to consider? And will you be on, on my side? And so the, the take home of this science study was that, yes, you know, if, if you have the people who are impacted by this issue talking to the general public, it makes a big uh, difference. The problem is that um, a co-author wanted to reproduce the study later on and couldn't. And um, it later came out that um, there was the, one of the main authors had a conflict of interest. Um, when the journal asked him to reproduce the raw data, he magically couldn't find the raw data anymore. So that study was retracted. Um, but it, it made a, a lot of news because first um, the news outlets published uh, about the, the study, like, look, this, is, this works. And then it, they later had to kind of backpedal and say, oh, it looks like this, this was not real research. Um, there was another case, um, actually a more tragic case, uh, 
in 2014 about how scientists reported that they could make stem cells by immersing cells in a, an acid bath. It was like this really, you know, just by stress, stressing them out. And this was like a really easy way to um, push stem cell research forward. Of course, nobody could reproduce that. I think this was, I can't remember if it was a science or nature paper, but one of those. Um, and so it eventually came out that they, um, there were uh, images that had been um, uh, tampered with and, and other data that was inaccurate. Um, and tragically, one of the co-authors of this paper um, ended up killing himself in the uh, aftermath. Um, I think the other way that, so besides fraud, which doesn't look good, the other way that um, irreproducible science makes an impact is just um, adding noise to what's out there. So um, there's a lot of bad science that's being re uh, reported and a lot of contradictory science. And um, how many people have seen this John Oliver clip? Okay, some of you, not all of you. It's brilliant. It's like 18 minutes long. I'm only going to show you two and a half minutes, but he hits every uh, angle of the, the reproducible research um, conflict that we're talking about today um, in a really well, good way. So if you have not seen it in its entirety, I'd encourage you to do that at some point. Um, so we'll just play it. I'm going to play you about <clears throat> two minutes. Science. The thing we love and respect so much, we only allow scientists to be portrayed by the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Nicolas Cage, and Al Pacino. That is how much we respect them and the complexity of the work they do. Science is constantly producing new studies, as you would know if you ever watched TV. A new study shows how sugar might fuel the growth of cancer. A new study shows late night snacking could damage the part of your brain that creates and stores memories. A new study finds pizza is the most addictive food in America. A new study suggests hugging your dog is bad for your dog. A new study showing that drinking a glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour at the gym. What? sound like science. It's more like something your sassy aunt would wear on a t-shirt. <laughs> and, and when studies aren't blanketing TV, they're all over your Facebook feed with alerts like study finds liberals are better than conservatives at smizing, your cat might be thinking about killing you, and scientific study shows that bears engage in fellatio. And by the way, I'm not interested. Let me know when bears start engaging in some mutually pleasurable 69ing. Hashtag bear pleasure, hashtag feminism. <laughs> Exactly. Time.com once even ran the headline, scientists say smelling farts might prevent cancer, which I would say was the most unfortunate thing Time ever published, but then this is a magazine that once did a cover story on those Asian American whiz kids. The point is, there are now so many studies being thrown around, they can seem to contradict one another. In just the last few months, we've seen studies about coffee that claim it may reverse the effects of liver damage, uh, help prevent colon cancer, decrease the risk of uh, endometrial cancer, and increase the risk of miscarriage. Coffee today is like God in the Old Testament. It will either save you or kill you, depending on how much you believe in its magic powers. And after a certain point, all that ridiculous information can make you wonder, is science bullshit? To which the answer is clearly no, but there is a lot of bullshit currently masquerading as science. So tonight, we thought we'd talk about a few of the reasons why. And first, not all scientific studies are equal. Some may appear in less than legitimate scientific journals, and others may be subtly biased because of scientists feeling pressured to come up with eye-catching positive results. My success right. as, a, as a scientist depends on me publishing my findings. So this goes into topics that you have probably talked about here. Um, but that entire piece is, is brilliant. He, he tackles all of the main points um, that are relevant today. Um, but you know what he, he ends with is that because there's so much noise out there, kind of what's happening is that people are cherry picking what they want to believe. And so um, I want to illustrate that through uh, the next two case studies, <clears throat> which um, are actually pretty recent. So um, this first one is about uh, research that has to do with uh, research. It has to do with uh, making 
ways of making healthy food fun. So um, Brian Wansink is a, a professor at Cornell, and um, yeah, I'm going to out him um, because he has been in all these um, uh, blogs and, and articles already. And he runs this food and brand lab uh, at Cornell University, which is very well funded. He's uh, definitely gone on the talk show circuit, um, has made himself a public figure, um, kind of advocating for his cause. And so um, one of the things that, that he does is, um, is kind of condone this idea that rebranding healthy food can make it more appealing to kids. And so uh, he has this smarter, it's, this has helped launch uh, what's called a smarter lunchroom movement. Um, so you can see that um, you know, he's, he's proposing that on the menu and with signs, uh, you can rebrand food uh, to say X-ray vision carrots or monster mashed potatoes, um, Popeye's pick for spinach, power packed peas. I don't know if anyone knows who, kid knows who Popeye is anymore. Um, or the superstar salad bar. And what he claimed in his research is that uh, branding food in this way can increase consumption by 30%. Now the problem is, <clears throat> Um, it's come out since that a lot of this, uh, this research is fraudulent. So here's one paper that was retracted um, just a couple weeks ago um, talking about branding in school lunches. And in fact, uh, people have um, kind of leapt on this guy's work. They've found red flags. If you look at this bottom point in 50 studies, three of those studies have been retracted and seven so far have corrections. So the way this kind of started coming to light, or one way this started coming to light, was um, his lab actually runs a blog. And he posted a blog um, titled, uh, The Grad Student Who Never Said No. And what this entire blog is about is how um, there was a, a grad student doing, doing some of this research. Um, they, he couldn't find any trends in the data, you know, no, no obvious conclusions from the data until he started manipulating the data. <laughs> and basically, he, he manipulated it so much that he got some of the answers that he liked. And so this is um, you know, something called p-hacking, which I, I won't go into, but you know, ways that you can kind of rejigger the statistics to give you the answer that you want. Um, and so you know, since this is a pr pretty prominent lab, a lot of this blog did get read. And people started saying, wait a minute, that's, that's not OK. <laughs> what else is going on here? And so, um, and so this is when people started digging more into it and found that in, uh, in a number of his papers, um, he, he did not use the proper statistical methods, um, that when people reanalyzed his data, the conclusions didn't hold up, um, that the data was incomplete or inconsistent. So uh, there was one paper um, where he um, the, the paper talked about the numbers of carrots that kids ate, but that number was different in three different places within the same paper. Um, there, he had two papers that had basically the same data in both of them. And I think, so it's, it's wonderful that this was caught. Um, and you can argue that you know, he's a target because he's a, he's a public figure um, for his, his field. Um, but it makes you wonder, OK, what, what was the journal doing? Why, why didn't the reviewers catch any of this? You know, how, why did it get caught through a blog and not at an earlier step, um, including the funding agencies and elsewhere? So that's something to consider. But something else to, to consider is that that paper, that, that recent paper that was retracted, already generated 72 citations. Um, that research was based on, had been given $99,000 in grant funding. Um, it fueled this $22 million Smarter Lunch Room movement uh, in 30,000 schools. So, you know, on the one side, on the one way of looking at it is that, oh, he's getting healthy food into schools, that's not such a bad thing. But it's all based on, appears to be based on fraudulent data. And this is money that could be used on scientifically proven research that is not being used, that's impacting a, a large number of kids. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, another case study, which I, I know you're all familiar with, but I think it's a really good example of how um, fraudulent data can have long-lasting impacts. And of course, um, we're talking about 
come on. Um, the birth of the anti-vaccination movement. Um, and so I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea that um, there, and I'll go through some of these numbers, um, that a, a lot of people are not vaccinating their kids for, uh, with the MMR vaccine and other vaccines. And this is having some serious public health impacts. And um, you can argue that there are many ways this could have started, but certainly um, this paper that came out in 1998 um, fueled at least some of this movement. Um, this was uh, published in The Lancet. Uh, the first author was Andrew Wakefield, a British, a British uh, doctor. And he basically was, uh, through this paper, uh, looked at 12 kids and uh, made the case that their um, autism or developmental delay was um, based on uh, the vaccine that they had just um, received. Now that, as you can see, that story is, that study has been retracted and I, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, and there are a number of reasons why. Um, one is that um, this research was irreproducible. Uh, this was, um, a, there was a small number of kids who were examined. There was 12 of them. There were no controls. Um, and it later came out uh, when uh, actually the British Medical Journal did an um, investigation uh, of, of this study that a lot of the data was fraudulent. Um, it was uh, misrepresented or altered. Um, so he, uh, there, were, there was missing information. Some of these kids started showing signs of their developmental delay before they were vaccinated, for example. Oops. Um, and, and some of the other information was incorrect as well. Um, he also had a huge conflict of interest. He received hundreds and thousands of dollars in funding from a, a law firm that was about to sue uh, one of the vaccine companies. Um, so this was unfortunate, but I think the reason this has um, resonated so much with, with some of the public is that it really taps into sort of this mistrust in the pharmaceutical industry, kind of this misunderstanding of, of what vaccines are and how they work, and, um, uh, and just, you know, kind of a suspicion of, of the medical community and science at, at large. And so, you know, today, this was published actually a, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, the, the anti-vax movement is, is huge. And in fact, you know, in, in some ways might be larger than ever. Um, so at this rally that was held in September, um, I believe in California, uh, this child holds a sign saying, today's my fifth birthday. Uh, I was denied school because I don't have 39 vaccinations. So in California and other places, um, you know, there's a law now saying that kindergartners um, have to have their vaccinations if, if they're going to enroll in public school. So this child is being homeschooled because um, her mom has elected not to vaccinate her. And then you have, you know, you're, you're wondering, well, why, why are, are people believing this? And, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the bottom answer is, you, you, you know, you can't reason with everybody, but you know, you get answers like this. Um, this uh, Jim Meehan, a former Oklahoma ophthalmologist, says, um, so they, uh, talking about these, um, these people at the protest, they know more about vaccine science than many pediatricians do. You can't rely on physicians who haven't done their own research. Meehan claims that vaccines have not eradicated diseases and that many infections, such as measles, are, uh, are largely harmless. He says vaccines contain dangerous additives and that testing has neglected to account for the effects of these additives. Um, the problem is, uh, you know, people like this are turning a blind eye to much of the research that has come out since the 1998 paper to refute that. Um, so, for example, um, this paper came out in the, the autism uh, link, link to vaccines paper came out in 98. And in, in California and, and in the UK and other places, um, you know, you've seen sort of a gradual decline since then in vaccin vaccination rates in kids. Now, what's interesting is that policy seems to make a difference. So since uh, they put th these laws into effect um, that kindergartners must get vaccinated to go to school, um, now you see this rise in, uh, in, in vaccinations again. 
But you can see it having an impact in other ways, and these are um, the cases of, of measles in the U.S. Um, in the year 2000, measles was declared eradicated in the U.S. And so what this is showing you is that over the years, um, from 2000, this was published in 2014, so 2000 going up to um, 2013, you've seen this you know, definite increase since 2000 in the number of measles cases in the U.S. And in 2014, um, it, it skyrocketed um, just within the first couple months of that year. <clears throat> and this is impacting real people. So this was a, a case that was reported on a measles outbreak that re was reported on uh, last spring. Um, and in Minnesota, um, well, so in this, this community in Minnesota, uh, they had 73 uh, measles cases. And that was more than the number of measles cases reported in the U.S. in 2016, just in this, um, in this community. Um, and these, these, outbreak, these cases were mostly in unvaccinated children, resulted in 21 hospitalizations. And what had happened is that... Um, there's a, a large uh, refugee community there from Somalia. And uh, people had been saying that um, there seemed to be a large number of Somali children who had autism. It's something they were noticing in the schools. Now it's since come out, um, now that people have actually looked at that data, that the rates of autism in Somali children are the same as the rates of autism in non-Somali children. But that's what people thought at the time. And so um, there's a, a large anti-vax um, vaccine, a community of vaccine de deniers in this community. And so they started counseling these, um, these refugees um, not to get vaccinated. And, um, and it worked. So the vaccination rates in this Somali community dropped um, pretty drastically, um, actually in comparison even to non-Somali children in that community. Um, and, and it resulted in, in a real harm. So, um, you know, someone had come in from the outside with measles. There were a number of kids that were uh, not vaccinated, and they became ill. But many of them became ill with the, with the measles. There was actually a study that was published today um, in uh, JAMA Pediatrics. Uh, I was putting some of this together at the last minute. <laughs> um, kind of uh, uh, bolstering this idea that, um, <clears throat> that vaccines matter. Uh, they can make a real impact. And so what, what this study is showing is that um, in the, the 1,780 measles cases reported to the CDC uh, among U.S. citizens between 2001 and 2015, 70% um, of these uh, individuals were not vaccinated. So, um, so vac vaccinations matter, and it's, it's the ones who aren't getting vaccinated who are being harmed. And unfortunately, these are usually young kids. Um, so this is you know, a, a, an example of, of a kind of a fraudulent science, um, you know, pu pushing forth sort of a, a bad agenda um, amongst the general public, and this is resulting in real public harm. So what can we say about um, how the public perceives science? Now, I don't think there are any studies saying that this inconsistency in um, the, the reporting of science directly impacts the public perception of science. Um, maybe that information is out there. I haven't been able to find it. But, um, but there is some information about how kind of the public view of science, you know, based on studies, um, kind of most notably by um, Pew, uh, the Pew Research um, which is a, a well-reputed um, research agency. Now, on the one hand, uh, this is from a study published um, this year. On the one hand, um, most Americans say that they trust scientists. So if you are going to learn about um, the health, health risks and benefits of the MMR vaccine, um, the general public tends to believe what medical scientists have to say as compared to uh, representatives from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, from um, 
alternative health groups, the news media, and elected officials. Um, um, when you're talking about the effects of climate change, which is also another poster child for, um, for the, this, uh, the effects of irreproducible science or reporting of science, um, they, people say they tend to believe climate scientists uh, over energy industry leaders, the news media, and ele elected officials. Um, and another hot button issue is um, uh, GMO foods, genetically modified foods. And again, they say they tend to believe scientists, but small farmers, uh, farmers who work on small farms are a close second, um, but more than food industry leaders, the news media and elected officials. But when you look to what people really think, um, their views on some of these different topics are quite different than they are from uh, scientists. So, um, so AAS, AAS members, these are members of the American Association, I'm missing an A, of science, um, you know, that runs the journal Science and, and other uh, publications. So these are people who obviously are either scientists or have a strong interest uh, in science. When you compare their responses um, to sort of, you know, people who represent the general public, um, science-minded people are, are, say that it's more safe to eat genetically modified foods than non-science-minded people. Um, let's see, climate change uh, is mostly due to human activity. The scientists believe that much more than uh, the general public. Um, childhood vaccines such as MMR should be required. That one's actually uh, uh, much narrower, but still that the scientists are, are in favor of that more than, than the general public. And you could say that this graphic, you know, maybe gets, gets a little bit further into the source of that disparity. Um, there's a lot of information here, so again, I'll just talk about a little bit of it. Um, this is from a 2015 Pew study. Um, but, you know, what they're asking here is um, what do Americans think about, uh, you know, scientific research and how it's being reported? And um, the general public thinks that there's a, a big problem in, in a couple of areas in particular. Um, the public doesn't really know enough about science to understand findings in the news. So you could say that's an education problem. Um, the public jumps to conclusions about how to apply new findings in their lives. Um, news media are too quick to report findings that may not hold up. Um, and I think also kind of notably here is uh, there are so many findings that it's hard to distinguish between high and low quality studies. And so you might argue, should those low quality studies be out there? Or if they are out there, then perhaps there should be a number of disclaimers with them. Um, so this is going to be a quick talk. <laughs> um, and so you know, when, when you talk about how the science uh, is perceived by the, the general public, I mean, who, who would you say is, is responsible for making sure that it's perceived accurately? The media. The media and, is that it? It's all the media's fault? Yep. <laughs> Stacy? person who can speak in a way that most people will understand and sometimes scientists can't do that and so that furthers the divide between people wanting to trust and what being able to understand what somebody's trying to say so. I think there's a mixture between entertainment that's in the guise of media where entertainment doesn't have a strict uh, policies of fact-checking and a historical you know, sense of reporting, uh, whereas media has guidelines that are pretty strict. Yeah, I think those are all good answers and they're all true. I mean, I would say, um, like with all of this, you know, the, the responsibility is spread up and down the totem pole. Um, scientists, as you probably talked about, um, have a vested interest in 
being published in the high-ranking journals, and so maybe they report on things prematurely, or um, uh, you know, the, the, and plus those journals have a, a tendency to uh, publish novel findings, which our uh, studies have shown are less reproducible over time. Um, funding agencies too um, are biased in in the types of research that they fund. Um, and maybe most, most notably, they, they don't really want to fund repeating somebody else's results that have already been out there. Um, and also, the, the people who make the incentives, the people who set the criteria for what is publishable here, for how, how do you get tenure, for who, who gets funded and who doesn't get funded. But like, whoop, like you were talking about, um, there's, there's this other top well, a layer that's closer to the general public as well. So Stacy and I are, are public information officers, so what that means is that when we have science news from the University of Utah Health to report on, uh, we work with the scientists to, to put something together. Um, you know, we, I think, do our diligence to make sure that we're not hyping that research, that we're um, pointing out the weaknesses as well as the strengths. Um, and, uh, and, you know, kind of putting that research in context in terms of what's been done before um, to, to really say, you know, what kind of an advance this is. Um, and like you talked about, the journalists for sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would say, you know, uh, maybe it's a no-brainer, but, you know, the top publications, you know, New York Times, um, The Atlantic, Washington Post, I think they do a really good job of, of portraying science accurately. Um, but, you know, it's the, the Daily Mail and <laughs> some of these other places you have to worry about. And these are the ones who are really good at making, um, you know, snappy headlines that, that are clickbait. Um, but the public has a due diligence as well, right? Um, you know, maybe we shouldn't be tweeting every headline, you know, some headline that, that sounds interesting uh, unless you read the story first and make sure you understand what uh, information you're kind of spreading to other people. Um, and, you know, at one point that um, John Oliver makes, um, well, and I guess I said earlier as well, is that, you know, for some people it's getting to this point where um, they, they just decide what they want to believe. There's so much out there, there's so much contradicting, um, so many contradictory stories. Um, I drink coffee, yeah, coffee's good for me. I'm not gonna quit. So um, <clears throat> uh, the public has a responsibility as well to be a, a critical thinker um, and, and so that they can make good decisions. Now you can argue that's something that should be taught in schools and it probably should be, but um, I think we're not quite there yet. Um, what I can say is that at the, the media level, um, people, there are, organizations that are really stepping up um, sort of the surveillance of what's out there. Um, Retraction Watch is probably the, the leader, um, and there that's Ivan Aransky and um, Adam Marcus, I think. Um, and they, they've actually broken uh, a lot of these, these fraud, fraudulent stories through their site. Um, so they, what they do is sort of catalog um, studies that are being retracted or that are under fire um, from other scientists and, and bring those to the, the forefront. And, um, you know, in, in an article, Ivan Aransky said, yeah, you know, it used to be that we would publish a couple of these a month, but now we're getting, you know, dozens every week. Now, I don't know if that means that people are just looking out for it more or that there's more more um, shaky science out there. Um, it's probably a combination of both. Well, it could be either one, really. Um, but but there, there's somebody who are making a difference. Um, Healthy News Review, um, they're actually really excellent. And they started uh, just a couple of years ago. And what they do is go through, um, so they're mostly doctors and, and PhDs. Well, I think you have to be a, either an MD or a PhD to be on the review board. And they go through sort of the top, um, you know, science article, uh, science uh, stories, health and science stories that are making it into the news. And they criticize the coverage and they criticize the press releases that got 
those studies out there in the first place. And then they actually take it a step further and they say, okay, if you're, some, if you're a journalist or a you know, public information officer, here's our guidelines for how you can write um, you know, kind of a well-balanced, accurate um, story. Um, and so they're, and they're even offering services where they'll look through your, your piece first before you publish. Um, so they're, they're, they're really making a difference as well. Um, there are some um, kind of niche data journalism sites that also I would say um, occasionally do, I mean, often do a, a good job of, of reporting on um, some of these irreproducible science, um, and that's uh, Vox and 538. And, and now this is increasingly being uh, picked up by the mainstream press as well, um, such as the New York Times and the Atlantic. Um, I noticed this um, job ad that just came out uh, within the last week um, from Nature, and they are actually looking for um, a, a reporter to solely focus on um, how scientists are communicating their research and on um, uh, how they're communicating their findings and the rapid changes in, in the way that is happening. So in other words, talking about um, matters uh, such as reproducibility, scientific publishing, scientific misconduct, and data management. Now you can argue that this is nature, only scientists are going to see these, but um, you know, kind of what I find is that you know, even in these very specialized journals, especially if it's a high impact one, um, if they dedicate a lot of time and resources to one subject, it eventually kind of makes it out elsewhere. Um, and so I, I think this is an important um, trend to how, how some of this is being resolved. Um, you know, for this, I, I, I don't, you know, I wanted to say, you know, have some slides saying, like, why does this matter to you? What can you do about it? And I, I don't have any strong um, points here to make besides, um, you know, of course, f for you who are here now, we're, I'm preaching to the choir. But, you know, I would say, you know, being aware of that, that this is an issue, um, talking about it with other people, and then, you know, making a difference in whatever way that you can. So as a scientist, it's making sure that you're, um, you know, doing your due diligence to record things as accur accurately as possible and to, to um, you know, uh, conduct scientifically sound research with controls and large uh, sample sizes and so on and so forth. Of course, no one's going to admit that they're doing shoddy research. Um, and you can, you can take this all the way up and down the line, you know, to the PIs uh, kind of overseeing what their, um, their students and postdocs are doing and so on. Um, you know, for people like Stacy and me, um, you know, I think we feel like we, we need to be very careful about, um, you know, how we write up some of the science that's being done here. And um, like I talked about, take careful measures to make sure that we're portraying that as accurately as possible. And I'm sure each of you can think of a way where you can uh, make a difference in your own way. So um, that's all I have. Um, I just wanted to put up my contact information um, in case anyone had any questions later on. But is there anything you'd like to ask now or talk about? Or, yeah? Well, so on, on the previous slide, I noticed, so all, your, all of your advice was, um, at least the way you were, were saying, was basically do good science, right? And I guess I was surprised that none of your advice was uh, geared towards figuring out how to better communicate yeah. that science or you know how to how to talk with a journalist yeah no I, that's that's an excellent point yeah um, uh, yeah and I, I think that's right I mean as maybe was it you who brought this up before that um, or Stacy actually that um, when when journalists or the general public don't understand what a scientist is saying, then they're not going to remember it. But on the other hand, if you oversimplify uh, and you know, kind of hype your research so that it's memorable, then you're being you're misrepresenting the science as well. So you're right. It's it is quite a it's a skill um, that uh, science. I think I would argue that scientists do need to work on um, in order to learn how to talk about their research and do it in a responsible way. Um, the National Science Foundation <clears throat> has a, a couple programs where they do train scientists to communicate to the public. There's also the Allen Alda Institute, which 
um, came out and did a workshop here last year um, in October. I don't have the date at the top of my head. Um, NPR is coming. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and it, this workshop is actually specifically geared for graduate students and postdocs um, so that they can learn how to communicate their research. So that's super cool. Um, uh, and so there are ways out there. Plus, our office does uh, media training. Um, so yeah, there are resources out there for sure. And I would, I would say that's a, totally an important skill. Yeah. I was going to say, one of the things that we're really trying to do with this series and with the other work that we're doing um, on reproducibility is do all of these things, be aware, talk about it, and make a difference where you can. But a lot of um, what we're seeing is this preaching to the choir syndrome. Do you have any thoughts about how to spread this message beyond the, the core group of people who already know that it exists? Yeah, it's always hard. It's like an incentives problem still. Uh, I, well, it's probably both, right? I mean, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we can talk about, um, you know, maybe we could put something on uh, at the U, for example, which goes out to all, you know, everyone at the University of Utah. Um, so, and in fact, maybe we can even think about writing an article for at the U about that. Um, you know, how this is a problem that affects really everybody, but, you know, is especially of interest to our scientific community, which is huge at the University of Utah, you know, spanning from, um, you know, computer science to health sciences. Um, and yeah, we have these, this cool series that's going on. Yeah, that, that's a really good idea. We should, we should think about doing that. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, anyways, that's the main thing right now. Yeah. I've heard some feedback that from people that it really should start at a grassroots level instead of being top down. But I also feel like, as shown by your vaccine slide, um, having policy in place from the top actually can make a difference as well. Do you have any feeling on that one way or the other? Does anyone else in the audience? I do think that policies are a forcing issue, right? I mean, it's too easy to just kind of do what you've been doing. Um, and so, you know, when journals start saying, okay, you have to produce, you know, you have to say where these cell lines came from uh, and that you've tested them, I mean, it forces you to do it. You know, if you have to say that your protocols have to follow these specific guidelines and it forces you to do it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you hate to, like you were saying, you hate to have the iron fist, but I think it's just too easy. Everyone's so busy that you know it's hard to justify taking these extra steps if you're not going to be rewarded for it in some way. Um, and so, yeah, I think policy changes are pretty important. And it, it's a culture too. I mean, and that's something that, like, how do you make cultural change? I mean, that's harder. That's what the grassroots part is, I think. So you're kind of going bottom up and top down. Um, I think it has to be both. So a lot. The, the conversation just here and a lot of the slides actually focused on on fraud and shoddy science and how that uh, I mean, impacts the public perception of science, right? But do you think that that's, I want to say, the, the main issue in the public perception of science? I mean, uh, because I would, I would think that, in fact, the, the main problem is actually about poor communication. Right, rather than, I, I just, yeah, I, I, I want to, I, I want to, yeah, no, I think, most of the science is good, right? Mm -hmm. And by the, and, and the, somehow the, the problem is, you know, that when it gets distilled down to something that appears on the, the 10 o'clock news, right, and it comes out and says, dog, is your dog psychic or something like that, right? He said, well, that wasn't at all what the science yeah. was about, right? And so, mm -hmm. I, I guess I want to. What, what's your take on uh, the relative impacts of fraud versus just just simple, you know, miscommunication? Well, I, I think it's both. I mean, that's sort of the wishy-washy answer, right? But I think it's true. I mean, um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's news coming out on studies 
that is inaccurate. I mean, the news story is inaccurate, and um, our friend John Oliver does a good job e explaining some of those examples. Um, but there's also a lot of publishing going on that, um, you know, maybe something wasn't quite ready for publication. I mean, it, it, it's both, right? I mean, so yes, I think there are a lot of reporters out there that maybe don't know that, you know, publishing something, I, I mean, here I'm, I'm feeding into biases again, but the publishing something in Cell might be a little bit different than publishing something in uh, Cell at, I don't know, today's Cell <laughs> or something like that. Um, so I think there has to be a critical eye on all levels. I guess that's sort of the wishy-washy answer. I mean, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I would say that, I mean, you know, my guess, I, I mean, having done research, um, you know, sometimes things just don't repeat. Like, you're doing the best you can, and like, something's changed in the water, or, you know, there are things that are beyond your control that you don't understand, and maybe will never understand. Um, that can you know give you re different results on a different day, and that's definitely contributing to this too. And maybe happens more often than outright fraud. I would hope that outright fraud is is the minimum, um, but it's amplified because it's more egregious. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I I think there's sort of things that are happening on all levels that that I contribute guess. to it. Yeah. So, I, so going back to the, the, the title, right? It's actually about you know, reproducibility. And So, uh, so what the focus on novelty is perhaps a contributor to, I guess I want to say sort of both, two aspects of the problem, right? Where one, where novelty uh, is uh, more likely to be published, right? And somehow, you know, novelty is also more interesting to the public, right? So that when when something comes out that suggests that your you know, your dog is psychic, right? That's much more interesting than the the reproducible study that right. your dog is not psychic or something like that. Um, I, I, yeah. I well. I, yeah. No. I, I see what you mean. Um, I what I can say is that um, I think that. The, there are being there are changes being made at sort of the reporting level, for example. So, um, you know, pl places I, I keep talking about these same ones because places that are because I respect them. But the Atlantic, um, Stat News is another one, um, and the New York Times, um, the Washington Post. I mean, they're actually pulling away from reporting on these one study findings. And they're trying, you know, there's definitely a, a lot of that that still happens. But they're also tr trying to um, look at the bigger picture. Like, okay, this question has been out there for a long time. You know, how have we been looking at it? And, you know, kind of what's the status based on this wealth of evidence today? Um, and actually, Julia Belus at Vox um, does a really nice job with that. You know, she'll take, a, like, a, a general question, you know, I don't know where she gets her questions from, but does sunscreen work, you know? something as you know, simple as that. And she'll go through the literature and, and say, well, this was a meta-analysis, and this was a small study, and you know, here are the strengths, here, here's what we can say, and here, here's what we can't say. So um, you know, I, that's not USA Today. It's a very specialized um, audience. But, but that sort of uh, reporting is going on, too. And I, you know, I like to think that, well, yeah, that, you know, like some people might give more credence to some journals over others. People might give, uh, you know, more credence to the New York Times versus the Daily Mail and, um, you know, maybe kind of look at that, that long view a little more carefully. Um, you know, I think you can also see that with the aut autism and vaccines research. I mean, there, people are still reporting on this, like, look, there's more evidence showing that um, you know these claims made long ago was false, and even though that is in a way kind of reproducing something that's been done before, I think that's something that's so much in the public eye um, that you know they figured it does bear repeating. You know, it is worth it to bear repeat to repeat it. Um, so some of that is being done, but yeah, there's a responsibility there for sure. So a lot of 
lot of what we do as librarians is try to teach people to critically think about research. And it's really hard to do even with people who are super hyper educated. How, what, how do you think that we should be working on trying to help the public critically think if they, if they do have some responsibility for this? Yeah, and that's, that's a harder, much harder question. I mean, I think one way you do it is by example. So w when there are these news stories that come out that are more in depth, it's like, oh, okay, this is a different way of looking at this problem or looking at uh, this scientific question. Um, these are different ways to, you, you know, to take a longer view um, and a more in-depth view of looking at it. Um, you know, I think if you were to talk to people at the Genetic Science Learning Center, they would say, you know, this has to happen, start happening in schools, um, you know, probably at a young age. Um, you know, that, and there's certainly merit to that for sure. I mean, you know, the common core standards in schools actually are starting to incorporate, you know, sort of critical thinking, you know, specifically looking at news and things like that and how you can sort of weed out sort of the more suspicious stories versus the more solid ones. Um, so I, I think some of that is being done. Um, whether it'll make a difference, I guess we'll have to see. I mean, because in the end, it's, it's too e sometimes it's just too easy to, you know, when you get that clickbait head headline, um, you know, coffee leads to uh, a longer life. And it's like, yeah, you know, even if you don't totally believe it, it's like, yeah, I'm going to retweet that because <laughs> I want to believe it, you know. Um, so, you know, all of us have that sort of, uh, not all of us, I can't speak for everyone, um, but it's hard to resist sort of that junk food mentality. Um, but um, I don't know. All, all, I guess all I can say is there are different ways to work on it. And yeah. I think we probably all do have confirmation bias. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Any other questions? I, I, have, I have one more question. So you had a slide, I don't know, somewhere in the middle, that it was a graph of the, the difference between opinions held by AAAS members and the opinions held by I think, the general public. And I guess the, the, my question was, uh, do, you have any, do you know whether that difference is changing over time? I mean, is, that, is, the, is the gap between public perception and you know, scientific consensus, is that, is that increasing or is it? That's an excellent question, actually. And I, I did not dig deeply enough to <laughs> be able to answer that question. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that question, but yeah, that's an excellent question. Any other last questions? Thank you very All much. All right, thanks.